We've known so little about the president's mother. We know a lot, quite a lot about his father, thanks to his book. Uh, but during the campaign and even before that, uh, the president's mother was always reduced to a series of rather uh, useful stereotypes. She was simply the white woman from Kansas, always coupled to the black father from Kenya. She, during the campaign, was the single mother on food stamps or the uh, cancer victim who died young fighting with her insurance company. In his book, she is the innocent abroad. Uh, so there's sort of a series of, of oversimplifications, which I think there's a little truth to all of those, but they obscure a much more complicated and interesting story. She really was thoroughly unconventional in the way she chose to live. She made some uh, extraordinary decisions for a woman at that time, or at, really at any time. She. Uh, chose to, she conceived a child and married an African at a time when nearly two dozen states had laws against interracial marriage. She took her child uh, at age six abroad to Indonesia at a time when there was enormous social and political upheaval. She went on to become an anthropologist working in small villages, uh, specializing in a, in a handicraft that was entirely a male preserve. So there's something very unusual about this person and I wanted to use in the title a word that conveyed that, conveyed her uniqueness without conveying also a judgment about her. I wanted a neutral term and I think a singular woman tells you this is a very unusual person who's worth knowing about but it doesn't tell you what you're supposed to think about her. I think you have to look at why uh, the president wrote that book in the first place, his, his memoir. It, the idea for it arose out of the moment when he had been elected the first black president of the Harvard Law Review. And in the aftermath of that election in 1990, uh, there were a number of articles written about him, really the first extensive media coverage of Barack Obama, and a series of profiles that ran in major newspapers. And if you look at those articles, uh, he begins to elaborate his life story, the story on which he subsequently based his introduction to the American public at the 2004 convention, and then on which he, the life story he used in the 2008 campaign. Um, and when he talks about his story in those early articles, you see increasingly an emphasis on his father. I think the book, in a way, because he was the first black president of the Harvard Law Review, was intended initially, the idea which came from an from a, 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 uh, agent, actually, the idea was to talk about his, his racial history, his race identity, and his finding of his race identity. So to some extent, he was telling the story of his coming to terms with the African, African-American side of himself. So the emphasis was more on his father. That, that would be one interpretation you could offer. He does, you're right, after, that book came out in 95. In 2004, after the Democratic Convention speech, he, the book became very popular again and was republished with a new uh, preface. And in that new preface, he said, had I known my mother was going to die, she died uh, shortly after the, the book was published the first time, had I known she was going to, uh, going to die, I might have written a different book, not a book about the absent parent, but a book about the one who was the single constant in my life. And then two years after that, he goes back in The Audacity of Hope and describes her even more uh, specifically in terms of her influence on him, shaping his values and giving him the impetus really to go into public life. Uh, and then when I spoke to him, he spoke about her again on those terms, but he went even further and he said she was, he described her as smart and sophisticated in her work, uh, which is not something I had ever really heard him talk about. So I think for a combination of reasons, he started out thinking about his father and is increasingly thinking about his mother. In her first few weeks at this um, at the university, as a 17-year-old freshman, she encountered Barack Obama, uh, the first African student at the University of Hawaii, and a Kenyan. He had arrived there actually a year earlier, not through the East-West Center, but increasingly was wrapped up in that you know, foreign student ferment there. So she met him. He was extraordinarily charismatic. Uh, he 
um, had a fantastic voice, according to people who, who knew him, which qu was quite brilliant. And uh, she had some kind of cataclysmic encounter with him. Uh, she was pregnant by November, early November. She dropped out of school. Uh, they married quietly. And on August 4th, uh, 1961, Barack Obama, the younger, was born uh, in a hospital in Honolulu. I do think that the evidence has been very clear for several years now, even before the release of the long-form birth certificate, that that's where he was born. The fact is the, the birth certificate that was released in 2008 by the campaign is the standard Hawaiian birth certificate. They do not issue, as a matter of course these days, the long, the quote, long-form one. Uh, but And that seemed to put the issue to rest for a while after the campaign was over, but then it resurfaced, precipitating the uh, release by uh, the president more recently. Uh, whether it has put the issue to rest entirely, I think, tells, it, it is a matter more for the people who make that argument, the birthers, than it is for the facts, because the facts have been out there. Uh, not only was the birth certificate very clear cut in 2008, and the long form one simply supports that, as we all expected it would, uh, but also there were uh, announcements in the Honolulu papers uh, within 10 days of the president's birth. Uh, announcements that were placed by the hospitals. You couldn't call the papers and put in an announcement yourself. Uh, the state uh, elected officials, Republicans and Democrats, had vouched for the veracity of the short form, supposedly, birth certificate uh, several years ago. So I think the material record is one thing, and then the opinion of people who choose to believe this, want to believe this for whatever reason, is something else. So he moved to Indonesia with his mother at the age of six. Indonesia is a very race-conscious society. Indonesians will tell you that. Very conscious of the color of someone's skin. And there were very few Africans or African Americans or people of African descent in Jakarta at the time that uh, the young Barack Obama lived there with his mother and stepfather. And I am told uh, that children teased him about it, um, it's, and, and even adults. Um, I interviewed some people who worked with her in Jakarta in 1970, 69, 70, in that first period, the first four year period she was living there. And they told me very kind of sweetly and innocently that she, that she would bring uh, her son to the office and they would uh, joke about his skin color and laugh at him. Uh, and, and I think he said laugh at him. And I said, laugh at him or with him? And, and he said, well, both. Uh, he said it as though, of course, that's, that's what we do here. <laughs> so I think there was a certain amount of awareness of his skin color. Another fascinating incident, which was related to me by a, um, an American woman who was living in Jakarta in Indonesia at the time, involved a lunch that she had with uh, Ann Dunham and the young Barack Obama when he was nine. Uh, and they went out for a walk after lunch in the city of Jakarta. And according to this woman, um, some Indonesian children ran alongside them and started to throw stones at um, the young Barack. And he just uh, sort of jumped around and do play, sort of played dodgeball with the stones and, you know, just laughed and uh, she said, as though playing dodgeball with, him with, with a hidden enemy, a hidden opponent. And Anne said nothing, Anne Dunham, his mother. Um, and the woman who's telling me the story was concerned because she thought possibly Anne didn't know that these. Indonesian children were yelling racial epithets at her son and she so she stepped forward to say you know sh should do you understand what's being said should we should I do something and Anne said no no he's used to it and this woman's conclusion was that she was really that she had decided to that in order to raise her child in Indonesia he needed to be fearless and she was encouraging this kind of fearlessness In Indonesia, many people pointed out to me that, particularly in Java, that there is a great value put on self-control. And to show your emotions is a, a sign of weakness. And that one of the ways this is inculcated in children is through this culture of teasing. And if you respond to the teasing and get rattled, you've lost. But if you laugh and act as though it hasn't happened, then you, you come out on top. Uh, and in Indonesia, many people think that um, some of the 
remarkable, cool demeanor of the president, which Americans find somewhat baffling, is actually a Javanese trait that comes from him having spent four years there at a very critical period in his development. I think the main one that Americans would, would notice and that was pointed out to me was this notion of uh, self-control and emotional restraint. Ann Dunham was not a religious person in terms of an affiliation with a particular church or even a specific religion, but she has been described by many people who were close to her, including her son, as a very spiritual person. She was raised uh, by, her parents had been raised in Baptist and Methodist families, but I don't think were particularly church-oriented themselves. But as a teenager, Anne went to an, uh, the youth group of a Unitarian church in Bellevue, Washington, that had very liberal, progressive values, and I believe played a role in shaping the uh, anti-redlining law in King County, Washington, and, and things like that. So she had this exposure early on to, the, to that uh, training, if you want to call it that, they would, uh, the youth group would often go to synagogues and temples and other, uh, the institutions of other religions and sort of observe them and come back and talk about them. So they did a lot of comparative religion. Later on in her life, according to her daughter, she sort of, she impressed upon her children the importance of respecting that every religion has something to offer and she was willing to kind of try out different ones depending on where she was. So she would make offerings in um, Buddhist temples and she meditated. Uh, a, a late in her life, a colleague of hers told me he felt that he, he, she was moving toward a kind of deism or unit, back to the, her Unitarian roots. So she was very spiritual and yet she did not like the idea of excess ritual. Uh, so it's interesting, the, the president's choice to affiliate himself with a specific church in a, in a very public way. That might be another area in which he really chose the opposite. When I interviewed President Obama, he uh, told me that his mother took her job as mother very seriously, and that's absolutely true. She went way out of her way to impress certain values on her children. Uh, the importance of hard work and caring about their education, the importance of humility and not being arrogant, and the importance of really that, that the highest value in life was to do something for other people, and that is the way she chose to live her life. And I think uh, the president, too, is, is, a, is a remarkable example of that, a person who says that he, those values informed his decision to go into public life and to become a public uh, servant and ultimately his, his work as president.